All right, hello and welcome to the Christian Basics series. Um, today we're going to be talking about and taking a look at the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So, who he is and what he does and more. So, Pastor John here, as always, right? But, um, so, let us get started now here. <clears throat> we have an opening verse from the Apostle Paul in the New Testament which will uh, help us here a little bit. <clears throat> he writes about the Holy Spirit. And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you. And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. God bless the reading of his word. That was <clears throat> from Ephesians 1, uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 to 14. So praise the Lord for, for his word, for the Bible. So in this letter here, in this little passage, um, we can already identify many um, aspects about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. People call it, well, pneumatology or pneumatology. I don't know, pronounce it pneumatology. It's the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. So <clears throat> as we consider this passage, we um, understand that the Holy Spirit dwells in us, right? So as believers, um, there's a change of heart um, that takes place in, our, in us, in our hearts and lives. And um, so um, how this all works together is basically um, like this. People hear the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, that is the word of truth, right? Believe the gospel and are saved as a result. That's, that's pretty much it. So um, about the Holy Spirit, we're going to look at about more detail about what he is, who he is, what he does, um, and also what this means is, is that the Holy Spirit is God's guarantee, Jesus' guarantee, um, um, the deposit of our inheritance to come. So, so this doesn't mean as we are, as we are saved as believers uh, in Christ that we just go out and live however which way we want. Right? That's not what the Holy Spirit wants, uh, the life the Spirit leads us to. But um, it's to uh, surrender to Jesus with, with humble, repentant, obedient hearts and to uh, follow his leading and prompting uh, through our daily walk of faith. <clears throat> and so uh, we're just going to be taking a little closer look at that. So we, we, we ask, so who is the Holy Spirit? Uh, we touched upon it about a little bit in the um, uh, doctrine of God. And in the doctrine of Christ, of course, and <clears throat> he's always there. Um, he's um, he's a third person of the Trinity. He is both fully divine and fully personal. In other words, he has all the exact attributes um, that uh, God the Father has, and our Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son, has. Right. Um, so we ask, why is he called holy? Why do we call him? the Holy Spirit, or not just, you know, Spirit or um, whatever else, but why is he called Holy? Um, the, the, the reason is because it's related to uh, his uh, God-given work and um, what, what God assigned him to do, right? And what is that? And uh, basically that is to conform us as believers to the image of Jesus Christ. Right? We call this process, it's called sanctification. It's a lifelong process. Um, so if you're following along this, this, this basic Christian basic series, um, as I said, he's in the doctrine of God. And um, so, but no worries if you've missed that or have, you know, forgotten what it is about. Here's a little recap for you. So the Holy Spirit is a person. He is a distinct person member of the triune Godhead, right? And he is co-equal with God the Father and God the Son. Uh, 
That's our Lord Jesus, God the Son, um, simultaneously uh, being one in essence with the others, therefore one God. Right? So uh, there's this thing, so three persons, right? But one God. Three unique, distinct persons, but one God. And that's also unique to the, uh, to the Christian faith. Um, so um, before we dig a little bit deeper here, we just want to make sure we understand um, who or what the Holy Spirit is not. Okay, is a big one. So um, the Bible does not reveal that much about him. I mean, Jesus tells us about him in the Gospel of John, as you have read and you've you know done your homework for sure, right? And John chapter 14, 15, and sixteen. Um, here is what the Holy Spirit is not. The Holy Spirit is not a ghost. Okay, I repeat, the Holy Spirit is not a ghost. Even though in the King James translation, you know, because that's the way people were writing uh, the English language at the time, uh, he's called the Holy Ghost, and that is um, accurate in that context, but he's not a ghost. Ghosts do not exist. Ghosts do not exist. Uh, those are man-made ideas, fictions, uh, whatever, movies, books, whatever. But simply, ghosts do not exist. So he's not a ghost. Also, the Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force, right, or an unguided energy field. Um, he cannot be manipulated in any way to do anything or to do something, right? Like we can't, you know, do whatever, and then the Holy Spirit comes. That doesn't work that he doesn't work that way. That's not how he operates, right? And he's also not an angelic being, right? Remember, we're talking about angels and about demons. Uh, he's not an angelic being or anything like that. He's the third member of the Trinity, and um, uh, that is just um, basically important to understand. And there are many misperceptions. We're also going to look at a few other ones. Um, so to understand uh, his the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So um, to receive him, there is no man-made uh, method or mechanism to receive him. It doesn't work that way, right? It's like kind of somebody does something and then, uh, you know, it's a replicable uh, mechanism to receive him. So uh, it doesn't work that way. The, uh, he doesn't, he, he doesn't, the Holy Spirit doesn't operate that way. God doesn't operate that way. Jesus doesn't operate that way. So um, some, there is a common idea uh, uh, or maybe misperception of, uh, you know, people speaking in tongues, whatever tongues are, um, as proof of having received um, the Holy Spirit. So just to be clear, um, just because somebody speaks in tongues or some unintelligible language uh, is not a proof uh, that people have received the Holy Spirit. Or in other words, if I don't speak in tongues, that doesn't mean I'm still not sealed and saved by the Holy Spirit, right? Or another idea is that people lay on hands and then that um, uh, is, 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 is the way and the only way to receive him or like as a mechanism or ritual, what you want to call it. That's false, right? Those are false, those are distortions of biblical truth, and those are basically man-made ideas. Um, here's a big one. Why don't we go with our Lord Jesus, see what our, G our Lord Jesus Christ has to say about the Holy Spirit. Um, he explains the Holy Spirit in this discussion in the Gospel of John uh, with a Pharisee who is named Nicodemus who visits him in the night and it's a wonderful passage. I just I, I pray and hope you will read uh, Jesus's encounter with Nicodemus, and um, so um, Jesus is explaining many many things to uh, Nicodemus, um, and also talks about this Holy Spirit. So listen to what Jesus has to say. So don't be surprised when I say, "You must be born again." The wind blows wherever it wants. Just as you can hear the wind, but can't tell where it comes from or where it is going, so you can't explain how people are born of the whole of the Spirit. God bless you, His Word. 
So basically, here we see um, that uh, Jesus tells us um, we can't explain uh, how we receive, who are born of the Holy Spirit, how we receive him. Um, uh, there's no mechanism, uh, method, ritual. But let's look at let's look at um, what we can find out and and how the, how the Holy Spirit operates um, in in the Bible, right? So um, in the Old Testament, he occurs um, uh, he points to God's uh, presence and uh, blessings, right? So um, he 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 he's not always. Um, present in people's, um, uh, all people's hearts and lives. That's a difference to the New Testament. Um, but he has certain characteristics. So we're going to look at those. Um, um, we're going to not, not uh, there's an article I created for you to share and, and read and um, see how he works in the Old Testament. Um, how he, um, how he's God's, uh, how the Holy Spirit witnesses to and about Christ, especially the coming of Christ. So there's a whole lot more to explore. So in the New Testament, um, once the um, the important thing is what what is similar to the Old Testament is that the Holy Spirit still points to God's presence and fulfills God's purposes. He does that in the in the Old Testament. He does that in the New Testament. He does that in and through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So um, you remember the baptism of Jesus, um, where the Holy Spirit ascends and John the Baptist um, witnesses um, that. Uh, he says, and God himself confirms um, the, uh, the divine uh, uh, messiahship uh, of Jesus Christ in in, uh, at the baptism, so the, the, the Trinity is there for God the Father, God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. So, um, so the difference is, is that um, once Jesus comes onto the scene, um, uh, the Holy Spirit always um, um, is manifested in a way that he always points directly to Christ. So after Jesus' resurrection and ascension, if you fall so far, we've covered these uh, very important uh, doctrines. So um, he, the Holy Spirit arrives at Pentecost. It's the Pentecost celebration following um, Jesus' ascension, right? And that's a big contrast to the Holy Spirit, which is in its temporal presence in the Old Testament. Um, so that's a big one. So there's five parts uh, characteristics or traits or uh, things that the Holy Spirit does. So, first, the Holy Spirit um, empowers and gives us new life, as Jesus Himself testifies. Right? We just read that in the passage in uh, Paul's passage above, and um, it is also through the Holy Spirit that Jesus is conceived. Um, Jesus Christ is conceived by the Holy Spirit. The Bible tells us that. This is important. To understand the incarnation of Christ, that is Jesus as God in the flesh. So here's one one. Here's a very big one to understand um, when we look uh, consider the opening passage from Paul's letter. We want to understand that the Holy Spirit. Um, so all, as we all turn to Jesus Christ in repentance and with repentant heart, and uh, He comes into our lives, um, the Holy Spirit then seals all true believers in Christ as to not falling away from God. So thereby our, our salvation is guaranteed. All right? Some people may say it a bit, you know, they not say it that way or they may promote some other idea, but all other ideas are false. Once we are sealed through the Holy Spirit, we cannot fall away from God. That's our guarantee, our salvation. Hence, sealed. Right? Like seal, God's guarantee. So our salvation um, cannot be lost. So we say, sometimes we say, um, once saved, always saved. And that's important to keep in mind. So another one is that um, uh, the Holy Spirit empowers us as believers, as Christians, to do God's will and, and God-given work. 
right? Um, in the article, I've, I've provided a much more detail there and verses for you to read and understand. Um, but it is important to understand that, for example, without the uh, Holy Spirit, um, um, we, uh, it is not possible to uh, fulfill either God's will or do God-given work. Why? Because the Bible tells us that. Jesus himself admonishes his disciples right, to wait uh, for the Holy Spirit to come uh, after his ascension. That's in Acts 1, verse 4 to 8. So um, it is only after the, um, the coming of the Holy Spirit that we as believers are empowered or even equipped um, to do um, God's work, right? And in the letters of Paul, yeah, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and uh, 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 chapter 14, 27 to 28, for example, uh, uh, Paul mentions a whole bunch of different uh, spiritual gifts. So those are things that God gifts us through the Holy Spirit. And important to understand is, uh, I just summed up a few points here for you, is that these spiritual gifts, whatever they may be, um, are always provided to build up and edify the church. Church is the body of Christ, uh, made up of all individual believers. Church is not a building. We'll talk about that later in another segment, another doctrine. But church is the body of Christ comprised of all individual believers. So as we said, for example, if somebody were to speak in tongues, um, it is a possible that somebody has that gift. There's a requirement that somebody else interprets um, what is being said in a way to edify the church. Why? Because there's no room um, for self-glorification. Uh, something important to understand. Or if somebody, you know, uh, an outsider went to the church, everybody's speaking in, in tongues and nobody understands what's going on. It was like, gosh, like that would be like chaotic. Right? And that's not how the Holy Spirit operates. That's not what speaking tongues means. Mm -hmm. So another one which is really important as believers, an encouragement for you too, and for all of us as believers, that sometimes we don't know what to pray for. Right? And um, praise Him, praise be the Lord. We, we can surrender that um, to the Holy Spirit who prays for us. It's in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And so this is a very practical um, aspect and shows us um, how much Jesus uh, loves and cares about us. And then he reveals this truth to us in the Bible. Here's the big one. Um, big one, very, very big one, as we had said. We're also dealing with um, spiritual warfare, right? The Satan, the devil, is prowling around. And uh, so um, Jesus reveals to us in the Bible the, um, the nature of spiritual warfare that we face. Um, both as believers and unbelievers. Um, so um, so a part of that is um, that the Bible tells us that it is the Holy Spirit who helps us to distinguish true from false, giving us spiritual discernment, right? And also understanding, um, Paul helps us in Ephesians uh, chapter 6, verses 10 to 18, um, that it is the Holy Spirit who, uh, who helps us overcome Satan in Christ's strength through the Holy Spirit, not our own. Very big one, big, big chapter. You want a big passage, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 to 18. That's It's called the whole armor of God. So that's something you also want to consider. Then the Holy Spirit purifies us. We had, we had said, uh, cleanses us from sin, uh, sanctification, and that's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. And um, it doesn't mean that we'll never sin again. Uh, most likely we will, but uh, it is a cleansing process, right? We call it sanctification, a lifelong process, part of the ongoing wor uh, work of the Holy Spirit, leading to growth um, in our personal holiness. I mean, it, God is holy, I, holiness for lack of a better word, but in our personal holiness, um, you know, the Bible tells us as believers in Christ that we are, we are saints, saints, whatever that means. Saints, therefore sanctified, sanctification, you see. But sometimes it's hard. You, you may want, not want to think yourself as a saint, as spoken sinner, and that's okay too. 
But uh, that's what the Bible tells us. That's what we are. Then the Holy Spirit also reveals things to us, right? He's an agent, agent of revelation. No, that does not mean fortune telling in any which way, right? That's against God's law. But um, he reminds us, uh, for example, in times of loneliness or when we have struggles um, or troubles, just like any other people, you know, Christians, we as believers have just, you know, we have the same uh, kinds of challenges that everybody else has. But the Holy Spirit helps us to um, uh, um, uh, remind us to turn to Jesus in prayer and to lead us back into the Bible, into his word. That's what he does, right? So he reveals to us, for example, that we sometimes have to wait for, sometimes actually more often than we like to think, um, to for God's revealed plan, purpose, and timing, right? In our daily walk of faith. And, you know, we don't, we don't like that, that we have to wait sometimes, but we do. So the Holy Spirit convicts us, right? And he convicts us of sin. And he says, oh, no, no, that's not the way to go. It's like, right, in our, in our hearts. And so he directs us and guides us, right, and helps us. So we have the assur assurance of salvation as being God's uh, children, right? We're, we're part of the family of Christ. And so it is in our witnessing then uh, to others um, that the Holy Spirit speaks on our behalf um, because sometimes we just don't know uh, what to say or witness or sometimes we'll just be still. We don't always have to talk. Maybe we'll just speak a prayer of blessing over somebody. Right? So, as needed, the, um, the uh, Holy Spirit gives us spiritual discernment as needed. The Bible passages are in the article there for you to read. Then, he uh, is very important. His goal is to unify us as believers. The Holy Spirit unifies us believers. So, um, we had mentioned spiritual gifts, but um, the purpose of every gift, as we said, is to unify and strengthen the body of Christ. That means fellow believers, right? We look after other people. We don't pretend to love others, right? And especially fellow believers, right? The Bible tells us that. So um, just as Jesus loves us and looks after the body of Christ, so are we called to look after the body of Christ as the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us. So um, where there is a um, unified uh, work of the Holy Spirit visible uh, as part of Christ's divine love, that's a sign of a spiritually healthy church community. It's, as I said, where others generally care about uh, their fellow believers and, and look after each other, right? It's not some kind of a club or, you know, in, in, uh, you know somebody's in, somebody's out. No, but people generally care about others and uh, see how they can uh, support each other, right? And that's very important. So, and then lastly too, it is the important to understand that the Holy Spirit responds to us as we are obedient and disobedient. So, um, as an example, when we are disobedient, for example, um, the Holy Spirit um, uh, speaks into our hearts. It's, it's something like a heaviness in our heart, um, something like that. And we realize, hmm, there's something not quite right. And we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it. And he does, as needed, right? According to God's will, plan, purpose, and timing. And so um, he helps us um, to, uh, to be obedient uh, to God. And, we, and also that we want to be. We want to be obedient to God. But sometimes we just don't know how. And that's okay, too. Right? Remember, the Holy Spirit prays for us. And that he does. So, well, you know, we can... As believer, we can ask him, Holy Spirit, please pray for me. I don't know what to pray for, right? Isn't that awesome? So that's something. So um, here's a big one then. Also that we are um, reminded that we are um, part of God's uh, entrusted family. And so uh, we must not give, um, we must not give in to temptations and Satan's strategies um, that lead us to fall into sin. So um, there's an event they recorded um, in Acts um, uh, chapter 5, uh, 1 to 11. It's Ananias and Sapphira. The early church community is coming together. And I would encourage you to read uh, what happens there. Um, 
and um, this is something we we want to address in a moment um, to look about uh, you know grieving the Holy Spirit, uh, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, committing the unpardonable sin. You may have heard about that. We'll address that in just one moment. All right. So let's just take a short break, and uh, we'll take a look at that. So, um, often people wonder or ask about blaspheming the Holy Spirit and or committing the unpardonable sin. So, we'll look at that. Um, what is blaspheming the Holy Spirit and committing the unpardonable sin? So, what is the unpardonable sin? The unpardonable sin is unique to Jesus' life and teaching, and it cannot be repeated by a Christian today. It's in Mark. You can read about it in Mark uh, chapter 3, 22 to 30. And we may ask, um, can I commit the unpardonable sin? No. Why not? Because this is a unique event. And um, what happens here is Jesus is performing a miracle uh, right firsthand in front of the Pharisees. And they say, it's, it's also in Luke eleven forty to 23. So the Pharisees witness uh, the miracle uh, that Jesus performs. And they attribute um, the Lord's work, or Lord Jesus' work, to Satan. And that makes them guilty of an eternal sin, as Jesus says, Mark 3, 29. So what that means is this is a unique and specific event and act of blaspheming God, which is not replicable, replicable right? We can't do it again. So can, uh, can I commit the unpardonable sin? No. All right. So what about what about the um, what about blaspheming the Holy Spirit? Can I blaspheme the Holy Spirit? So I have it all written that, that, uh, uh, a little bit more to, to it. Um, to um, in other words, the short the short answer is as a believer, no. Um, blaspheming the Holy Spirit, no. Um, but um, you want to look at the article that is there to give a little bit more insight uh, to explain what blaspheming the Holy Spirit um, actually is. All right, so um, Jesus' desire is that uh, he wants everyone to be saved and understand the truth, namely the gospel, and namely his coming. So um, we, we cannot, as believers, commit, the, we cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's that's pretty much it because that's in one Timothy two verses three to four. The Bible tells us. Um, however, what we can do um, is um, the um, um, as believers we can grieve the Holy Spirit. That is something else. We can can a believer grieve the Holy Spirit? Yes, and why is that? So. Um, while a believer cannot blaspheme the Holy Spirit, he, he, a believer can grieve the Holy Spirit. So we can read about that in, in 1 Corinthians 14, 32, because the Holy Spirit will never override our free will and the choices we make. Right? So we want to avoid uh, grieving the Holy Spirit, but no true believer in Christ intentionally grieves the, grieves the Holy Spirit. But it is possible, all right? So we read that, I'll read it to you. The verses, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 to 32. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. God bless me with this word. So the Bible, Paul writes here, um, admonishes us not to grieve the Holy Spirit. And uh, yes, sometimes we do uh, uh, commit and we transgress against God and the Holy Spirit convicts us. Um, but that is always our call to then immediately repent as we immediately turn to Christ. Remember 1 John 1, 8-9 to, to, um, 
to uh, confess, repent, and um, so the Holy Spirit will convict us and help us then to turn to Christ. And uh, the sooner we do that, the better. I mean, don't if 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 we, if we get the sense we've grieved the Holy Spirit, it's important to turn immediately to Christ and uh, confess and repent to Jesus. Okay, so. Um, there's many, many more things that can be said about the Holy Spirit, um, but the most important thing is that the Holy Spirit is there to guide us and to help us to go into the Bible, into God's Word. And that's why we call the Bible God's living Word, because it is unique. It's not some magic book or some kind of a trick um, um, book, but it's God's living Word. And through the work as believers, through the work of the Holy Spirit, we can just open a Bible passage, read, and God can speak in and through the Holy Spirit in our hearts, connect to our Lord Jesus Christ directly through the Bible, and give us direction and sense and purpose, or calm us and strengthen us and uh, help us. Right? That's why the Holy Spirit is there. So that's one of the main big ones that He um, He uh, He helps us to go into the into the Bible into God's Word. So. Um, he will always, he will never do anything that is not part of God's perfect plan, purpose, and timing as believers. Never. The, we, we must listen and heed to the Holy Spirit's voice in our hearts. And how we do that is that we spend um, as much time as we can in the Bible and then grow in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ through word in the Bible and in prayer. Right? So here's a big one, just big one, big, big, big. So the Holy Spirit, we can trust the Holy Spirit because he only does what Jesus tells him, right, to do. And he will never compromise, never compromise a single law, a God-given law, or violate it or tell us to violate it, such as the Ten Commandments, for example. And he will never violate any of um, the teachings of Jesus and the uh, precepts uh, that Jesus gives us. Never, period. We're done. All right. So, again, uh, revisit John fourteen verse, uh, John chapter fourteen to sixteen, and learn more about what Jesus says about the Holy Spirit. And then, as the New Testament unfolds with the early church and Acts, and and especially also in Paul's letters, we can learn much more about the Holy Spirit, um, and understand uh, who He is. And what he does. So what he does. So here we have a basic overview, and um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, uh, we have um, a link in the video description for you again. You can freely access, revisit, and I encourage you to read everything uh, about the Holy Spirit. There's much more. There's Bible verses uh, to look at and read for you. That I hope you read and. Um, your goal, goal is to, to, to open the Bible, read and study it. Um, it it's, it's, it's a big part. It's, it's a major part and really mandatory to do so as we grow, as, as we, want to, we want to grow and to grow in our relationship with Jesus. So it's important to, um, to uh, spend as much time as we can in God's Word and ask the Holy Spirit to uh, speak into our hearts and reveal what we are. Uh, learning there, right? Okay, so uh, lastly, so we're going to consider the homework for you. We're going to be moving here uh, to the doctrine of the church. And so read a little warm up. Uh, you can read in the book of Acts. Um, that is Acts uh, 1, verse 5, as the church begins, chapter 2, 1 to 4, and 11, uh, 15 to 17, as a little warm up. I'll give you the verses again. That's the book of Acts. The also is called the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 5, uh, chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, and 11, chapter 11, 15 to 17. Just as a little warm up, okay, to, to get ready for that. Okay, short prayer. So, Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you for this blessed day and for being with us. Thank you for the gift of the person and power of the Holy Spirit working in and through us to help us, to convict us, convince us, and to always lead you 
lead us into your truth, Lord Jesus. I thank you for that. And leading us into your word, into the Bible, and blessing us with um, all the blessings we need. And we're grateful that you've released him to us, Lord Jesus, our helper, our paraclete, our helper, our guide, um, our friend, um, uh, who will never violate any any of your commands at all. So I'm just so grateful for you that you've uh, released him to us to help us and guide us into your truth. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for all of these blessings and love you and praise you. In your holy name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And always remember, the best Bible is an open Bible. Please join again soon.